Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to the House of the Lord for our worship service uh, this morning, uh, virtually. Uh, as uh, you may have known, one of our office staff has uh, visited a place which later declared infected with the COVID-19. As a precaution, the Elders Board has uh, decided to suspend the in-person services uh, today and move all services uh, online. So in, meanwhile, we will do our best to have the church facility uh, disinfected and cleaned before uh, next Sunday service. So we uh, are sorry for the inconvenience caused and we covered your prayers and support uh, as we continue to um, yeah, disinfect Lord, our, our church uh, facility. Let us now, uh, in silence, uh, prepare our hearts uh, to worship Him. Call to worship this morning is taken from Psalms 93 verses 1 to 4. The Lord reigns. It is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up your vo their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Let us pray. Father, Father God, Almighty Lord, we come before you and acknowledge that uh, you reign and you rule over us all. You are robed in majesty. And Lord, we want to come and, and declare that fact. Your throne is established from of all. You are from everlasting. Lord, we want to come and praise your name forever. We ask God as we come this morning uh, into your presence, uh, into your court, uh, though virtually, uh, we ask that your spirit will be with us. Uh, we pray for all the proceedings, Lord, the, the worship, the sermon, and all this thing that will go on smoothly, Lord, as we uh, stream online uh, via YouTube and via our Zoom uh, app. We ask God that uh, uh, you be in the presence uh, with us, and we ask that you be pleased uh, with our worship this morning. We commit our worship service to you. All this, Lord, we pray uh, in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Right now, I would like to invite the uh, worship team uh, to lead us in worship. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to Victoria Chinese Alliance Church's English service is first uh, unplugged edition of uh, worship. Maybe not the first time, but first time for uh, pre-recording. Um, I know there's a lot of things going on with the church and that we had to quickly set things up. So I do want to thank you all for being so uh, patient with us if there are any issues that happened before or, or you know, being understanding as well. But we are still going to sing some songs today, and I have three songs that I've chosen uh, for the set list. And today we're going to start with The Lion and the Lamb. I will let you know as well, uh, I'm going to be looking at the iPad for my music because I have it memorized the chords. So if you guys do happen to be looking and you see me looking to the left, uh, it's just because I need to make sure I'm playing the right chords. <laughs>
So the next song I've chosen is, uh, when I can change the tab here, Battle Belongs. Uh, so just making sure I have it ready.
Um, for the last song I've chosen, I have chosen uh, The Stand, um, once it loads. <laughs> um, and I think it's just a great reminder when it comes to everything, especially with what's going on now still, and you know, with numbers, you know, sometimes going higher and, and even things with uncertainty that we can still just remember what the stand it says, you stood before creation, eternity in your hand, you spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. And I just think like even with the pre-chorus saying, offering our heart to God completely. And I think that is something that we can do even during the times of trouble and uncertainty. Like I said, we can't just give everything to him and we can stand together as a family through this tough time and continue to build each other up. So just like as we need to walk as one, I think as well with worship right now, we should sing as one as well. So let's sing the stand. <laughs> Can I do? 
much for your worship. Uh, I'll pass it back to the chairperson, I think. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Silas, for leading us in worship. Uh, let us uh, have some time in greeting one another. Um, well, this time around, uh, we have to do it with uh, virtual hugs, and perhaps you can just wave at each other, or if you can key in a few words in the chat column of the YouTube channel, uh, you may do so. For myself, uh, all my devices are occupied at the moment, so I cannot do that. So, but anyway, grace and peace uh, to you all. I will give you some time to uh, greet one another, right, through the chat column. All right, uh, let us continue our worship with our tithes and giving. Now, obviously, there will be no physical collection or offering, but if you would, you know, you can uh, write a check and uh, send it to the church uh, office. Oh, by the way, uh, you can't do that because I think our church office will be closed actually for the next few days because of the uh, COVID-19 infection. I'm sorry about that. So perhaps you can keep your offering and your tithes until next Sunday, and it will be a double portion of uh, offering uh, to God on next Sunday. Let us now uh, listen and meditate upon First uh, Chronicles sixteen twenty nine as we offer to Him our tithes and givings. First Chronicles sixteen twenty nine says, "Ascribe to the Lord due His name." Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Let us pray. Father God, we want to come now to honor you with our tithes and offering. Please accept it as our continual trust in your rich provision for our life and ministry. Use it for your glory and for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. I refer you now to the church bulletin for our announcement today. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, the church office will be closed for one week so that uh, the pastoral staff or sorry, the uh, church staff can observe a seven day uh, stay home uh, quarantine. Um, this is the first time uh, for a long time to come, you know, that uh, we are back uh, to our online worship. Despite, you know, uh, we want to give God the glory and we want to thank him uh, for making all things possible. Now, the, the next uh, item to announce is that uh, uh, next week, September 24th to 26th, uh, will be our Seamless Link Mission Weekend. Uh, we will have uh, three events. Uh, first, the first event will happen on Friday, September 24th um, uh, via Zoom. Okay. And uh, the time will be uh, from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Um, it will be uh, the, the topic will be Jose and uh, Jocelyn sharing their mission journey uh, from Af Africa to the calling to Japan. Uh, it will be in Mandarin and English. And then on Saturday, uh, September the 25th, via Zoom again, uh, from 7.30 to 9 p.m., uh, it will be the same topic, 
uh, the Jose and Jocelyn will be sharing with us. Uh, this time it will be in the English and Cantonese. Then on Sunday, September 26th, that is next Sunday, uh, it will be a joint uh, mission Sunday service. Remember, the time for our worship will start at 10 a.m. Our speaker for the day will be our assistant district uh, superintendent, uh, Lisa uh, Rolrick. Uh, she is the district superintendent for mission mobilization. She will, she will bring us uh, God's message uh, for us on that Sunday. Now to join this, uh, the fr Friday and Saturday Zoom meeting, uh, you can click on the link um, that is listed in the uh, church bulletin. Um, yeah. So remember that uh, still that next Sunday, September 26th, will be a joint mission Sunday starting at 10 a.m. The Senior Pastoral Search Com Committee is already established. The members are uh, uh, the elders uh, representative, um, uh, Elder Ida Mao and Elder Eric uh, Chui. And then our English Congregation representative, uh, Mr. Carlos, uh, Brother Carlos Chan and Brother Dave Wu. And for the Mandarin Congregation representative, uh, they are um, Brother Michael uh, Singh and uh, uh, Brother Jun Lin Ma. For the Cantonese congregation representative will be Brother Sam Chan and uh, Brother Koji Sham. On that Sunday also, October, uh, sorry, on, on the Sunday on October the 10th, uh, we'll be accepting offering for the Jeffrey Offering Fund. Uh, it will be during the Thanksgiving Joint Sunday service on October the 10th. So please uh, give uh, your support generously to this ministry. But since the uh, BC government has decided to, to, to delay the stage four of reopening, out of an abundance of uh, caution. In accordance, the Children's Sunday School tentatively is planning to reopen on October the 3rd, pending any further government, governmental changes. We thank you for your understanding in this matter. Also, the men's ministry will be starting its first meeting on October the 6th, a Wednesday, at the church basement from 7.30 p.m. to 9.00 p.m. Uh, all brothers uh, age 30 and up and are invited uh, to join this, uh, this uh, ministry. You can email uh, wankerr at gmail.com or carlos29 underscore 63 at yahoo.com if you have any other further questions. The nomination of elders has begun. Please continue to pray uh, for the process. Now, allow me some time to uh, share my screen as we move into listening to God's word. Today's sermon is entitled, Either Food, 
knowledge and love. Let me start by reading the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Let us give our undivided attention to the reading of God's word. First Corinthians 8, 1 to 13. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, it is love. He's, he's sorry, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. Although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge, eating in an idol's temper, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. For many Christians, especially those residing in Western society who are familiar with this passage would likely discount it as irrelevant to them. Well, this is understandable, but it is especially challenging for Christians with a Chinese religionist uh, background where their parents or grandparents are non-Christians and devout Buddhists or one who worships the Chinese gods or goddesses. Very often, the Chinese Christian would have to make excuses for not attending any kind of celebration or dinners with religious components organized by their non-believing grandparents or relatives. And for Chinese, there are many such occasions like the Chinese New Year, the Dragon Boat Festival, and the Mid-Autumn Festival, also known as the Moon Cake Festival or the Moon Festival. As a matter of fact, the Mid-Autumn Festival is just round the corner on this coming Tuesday. I, for one, would not miss the Moon Cakes, especially the Durian Moon Cake. It may not seem relevant to many who reside in North America, but the principle that we can learn from it is very re relevant if we are to minister to those new Christians with a different religious background or those who have been set free from some other spiritual experiences. In a multicultural society like ours, there may be a good chance that we are invited to an Islamic or Hindu wedding celebration. The universal principles derived is applicable to many gray areas like uh, uh, alcohol drinking, smoking, gambling, uh, Chinese acupuncture and Chinese medicine, Chinese martial arts, or even eating Islamic halal food or the Jewish kosher food. 
our approach to this topic of food sacrifice to idols will take the following steps. First, we will study the passage as close as possible in its original context. Second, we will derive the application principle in accordance with its original context. Third, we will seek to apply those principles in situations that have all the same or compatible parameters and also apply the principle universally in gray areas mentioned earlier. Now, since the coverage of the topic begins at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, and continue through chapter 11, verse 1, we will deal with step 1 and 2 of the three chapters in two to perhaps three sermons. And then we'll deal with step 3 as case studies in another two to three sermons, perhaps. All right, uh, we have said enough. Let us now dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, immediately, we are met uh, with the directional signposts concerning this. If, if, you would, if you were to remember, right, concerning this is the directional signposts that point us to the issue of food offer to idols. We will first deal with the beginning principles regarding uh, food offer to idols. The passage is from verses 1 uh, to verses 6, right? I will not read it since we have read it on earlier. Uh, from verses 1, uh, Verses uh, 6. Having dealt with the question about marriage and singleness in chapter 7, Paul now addresses in this Corinthians chapter 8 to 10 the next of their questions regarding eating food that have been sacrificed to idols. Food offered to idols was also an issue in Corinth of Paul's time. Many of the Christians in Corinth may have only recently come out of the pagan religions. As such, certain of the pagan links may be carried over into the new faith, including their links or connection with the pagan temple. You see, the pagans in ancient times often invite their friends to their temple to worship during the regular seasonal festivals or at events such as celebration of births, marriages, and, and times of good fortune. Large quantities of food will be sacrificed before the so-called gods. The food usually meet offer on pagan authors is usually divided into three portions. One portion was burnt into a sweet aroma to please their gods or in honor uh, to their name. The second portion will go to the priest. And when the priests have had enough through the many worshippers in the temple, they would then sell it to the marketplace or sell it to the temple restaurant. And the third portion will be eaten together by the worshippers and the friends they invited in the presence of their gods. If there is any remainder, they will bring it home to eat it. Now to eat such idle food in the temple, therefore, means to eat a banquet in honor of the gods or deity. It is the same as worshipping the gods in the temple. And to add to the problem, it is quite probable that the eating of idol food in the temple may also be accompanied by gross sexual 
immorality. Obviously, the issue of idol food raised many questions for the Corinthian Christian. Questions like, uh, can we eat the meat purchased at the temple meat market? What if we are served meat purchased at the temple meat market when we are guests in someone else's home? Or can a Christian eat at the restaurant at the pagan temple? These might be the questions that the Corinthians are asking in the letter to Paul, and to which Paul is replying. Note carefully in the English Standard Version, certain phrases are in quotation marks. Those are the quotation by the Corinthians, and Paul is quoting them in his reply and argument. Some Corinthian Christians in the letter argue that all of us possess knowledge, in quotation marks, note, all of us possess knowledge about food. Most likely that all food are freely given by God for our consumption, which likely refers to chapter 10, verse 26, quoted by Paul, that says, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and on which Paul agrees. However, he counter argues in his letter. He says, This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So he counter argues the Corinthians uh, quotation okay, or the question this by saying that this knowledge that they claim that they have puffs up but love builds up. Now, both knowledge and love have an effect on our lives in that each of them makes something grow. The difference between puffs up and builds up is striking. Some Christians grow when built up, um, while others just swell when puffed up with pride, perhaps like this puffer fish. Christian behavior is founded on love, not knowledge. And the goal of the Christian life is not knowledge, but love. And then Paul reminded them that if they think they know it all, they really do not know anything. With this, in my opinion, Paul is alluding to the fact that either food, that is food offered to idols, has more to its nature than the Corinthians do not know or want to acknowledge. Yet that is a knowledge that is important. That is the knowledge of God, the knowledge God has of those who love him. And this verse that says that if anyone loves God, it is known by God. Those who love God, they know that they belong to him. Next, uh, Paul moves on to talk about the reality of idol food. There is a need for us to understand the reality about idols. Note again, Paul is quoting what they had written to Paul. That is in quotation, um, it says, an idol, uh, sorry, that's, that's the first word. an idol, has no real existence, and there is no God but one. Obviously, the Corinthians are arguing on these two facts they knew. They may have reasoned something like this. Surely, you cannot expect us to believe all these memes about the danger of idols. We are intelligent people, you know, who know that idols are nothing. Our God is the only true God. 
Those silly idols cannot harm us. Now Paul actually agrees with them, but he, he then qualifies it further uh, in verses 5 uh, to 6 over here. He's teaching, he's teaching them that the so-called gods of the pagans are unreal, and that the real gods and lords, whatever they may be, are all subordinate to the one supreme God whom alone we recognize. To Paul, there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. The Father is the source of all creation, and Jesus Christ is the dynamic one through whom creation came into existence. If meat is offered to Zeus, say, there is no real Zeus out there. There is no other God but one. There are many images that are supposed to be representation of divinities, but these divinities are nothing, a thing they believe to be real, but, but, that, but, but that exists only in the imagination. And these images have no corresponding realities. The Korean Christian may have reason out like this. If idols are real, really nothing, if idols are really nothing, it must mean nothing to eat food sacrificed to idols. And it must mean nothing to eat in the temples used to worship these idols. Earlier on, we mentioned that the Corinthians might be asking questions like, uh, can we eat the meat purchased at the temple? Uh, and sorry, can we eat the meat purchased at the temple meat market? What if we are served meat purchased at the temple meat market when we are guests in someone's home? Can a Christian eat at the restaurant at the pagan temple? But when we read of Paul's forceful counter arguments in the verses and chapters that follow, we can conclude that those are not the questions that they are asking. The real question they are asking is not, uh, can we eat either food? But why can't we eat? either food. Why can't we eat either food? Now this is a challenge actually to, to Paul. Basically the Corinthian Christian or some Corinthian Christian are challenging Paul to that. Tell me why. Tell me the reason why we cannot partake of the either food. Basically, the Corinthians are divided over this issue of food offered to idols. And the dispute is not entirely between Paul and the Corinthians. Rather, the tension is within the Corinthian community itself, between the weak and the strong Christian, and to which we will now turn to. Paul's first concern is with the attitude that lay behind the behavior and argument. The abuse of other weaker brothers and sisters in the name of knowledge indicates a total misunderstanding of the nature of Christian ethics, which springs not from knowledge, but from love. Our Christian behavior or conduct must be based on love. If we are to act on the principle of love, then we must recognize that not all have the same knowledge. That is our first point. Not all have the same knowledge. The Corinthian Christians who felt free to eat at the pagan temple May, may have based their freedom on correct knowledge, that is, 
knowing that idols are nothing. But for some, they have former association with idols, and they eat food as really offered to an idol. Paul urges uh, the Corinthians. Paul urges the Corinthian Christian who know there is nothing to an idol to remember that not everyone know this fact. And if someone believes there is something to an idol and they eat meat that has been sacrificed to an idol, their conscience being weak is defiled. Why is, why is their conscience considered weak? Not because their conscience doesn't work. Indeed, it does work. In fact, it overworks. Their conscience is considered weak because it is wrongly informed. Their conscience is operating on the idea that there really is something to an idea. Their conscience being weak is defiled. You can imagine the free Corinthian Christian with the superior knowledge saying, but we are right. In, this all, in all this matter, we are right. And in this case, being right is important, but it's not more important than showing love to the family of God. Our Christian behavior or conduct must be based on love. If we are to act on the principle of love, then we must recognize that what we eat or do or do not eat does not make us more spiritual. What we eat or do not eat does not make us more spiritual. Food does not commend us to God. We are not more spiritual if we know idols are nothing and feel a personal freedom to eat food sacrificed to idols. On the other hand, no one is less spiritual for abstaining from food sacrificed to idols. In Acts chapter 15, verses, uh, verse 29, the Jerusalem council sent a letter commanding some churches to uh, abstain from things offer to idols. But Paul's discussion of the issue here does not contradict what the Jerusalem council decided in Acts 15. Instead, it shows that the council decision was not intended to regulate all the church all the time. It was a temporary arrangement meant to advance the cause of the gospel among the Jews of that day. This is the very point where most stumble in issues relevant to Christian liberty, such as uh, watching movies. Uh, in particular, you know, when the Harry Potter movie uh, first came out, you know, there were a lot of discussion and a lot of debate as to whether Christian should be watching the Harry Potter movie. Um, then we have drinking, uh, listening to perhaps hard, hard rock music. And that is actually a, a, uh, a similar, a, a series of lecture that is based on this topic of hard rock music. And then it is entitled The, uh, the Hell's Bell. Okay? The Hell's Bells. that talk about whether Christians should be singing hard rock music. They assume that one stance or another is evidence of greater or lesser spirituality. Our Christian behavior or conduct must be based on love. If we are to act on the principle of love, then we must recognize that what does matter is love towards those in God's family. Paul urges the Corinthians to take care that somehow this liberty of theirs you know, will not become a stumbling block to the weaker brothers or sisters. 
A Corinthian Christian with superior knowledge might feel the personal liberty to eat food sacrificed to idols. But is he exercising this liberty in a way that becomes a smuggling block? Paul says, you Christian who say you have knowledge are claiming your rights. What about the rights of the weak brother? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. God had not given people knowledge that they thereby should be a means to harm and to destroy, but to do good and to save others. It is a most absurd thing for any to use their knowledge, therefore, to the destruction of others. Why is the brother who will not eat the food sacrifice to an idol consider weak. Many Christians would consider that one to be the stronger Christian. However Paul, is, however, Paul is not speaking about being weak or strong in regard to self-control, but in regard to knowledge. To influence the weak brother to go against his conscience and thereby wound their weak conscience is actually to sin against Christ. The Corinthian Christians who abused their liberty might have thought it was a small matter to offend their weak brothers, but they did not understand they actually offended Jesus Christ. In doing so, they were actually encouraging their brother to sin a weak brother to sin. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. Paul makes the principle, the, the principle clear. Our actions can never be based only on what we know to be right for ourselves. We also need to consider what is right towards our brothers and sisters in Jesus. It is easy for a Christian to say, I answer to God and God alone, and to ignore his brother or sister. It is true, we will answer to God and God alone, but we will answer to God for how we have treated our brother or sister. At the same time, the issue is making a, a brother stumble and, that, and, and stumble over an issue that has direct relevance to the brother in question. Paul would never allow this principle to be a way for a legalist to make demands and bind a Christian walking in Jesus. In closing, there are two basic principles that we have learned today. The first one is the beginning principle regarding food offered to idols. And we have described as Christian behavior is founded on love, not knowledge. And the goal of the Christian life is not knowledge, but love. So basically it's love over knowledge. That is the first principle that we should learn and apply it uh, in issue that relates to this food offer to idols. Second, second principle which is acting on the principle of love. This is also called uh, the stumbling block principle. It's best expressed as uh, in, 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 the, in the verse itself that Paul says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. Our actions can never be based only on what we know to be right for ourselves. We also need to consider what is right.
towards our brothers and sisters in need. Um, we, have, we have come to the end of the sermon. As I mentioned earlier, we will not be doing with any kind of application, but we will merely state the principle that we have learned today. So the two, the two principles, uh, the beginning principle of love over knowledge, and the second principle, the principle of the stumbling block principle that we have on the principle of love. Um, so I commit, I, I submit to, to, to you uh, for your consideration of some of the principles uh, that we have learned today. Uh, knowing that uh, this passage and the following, pass uh, following chapters that, you know, uh, is a uh, extremely uh, complex and difficult passage actually to uh, interpret. This is one of my, my position in um, expositing uh, uh, chapter eight in itself, right? uh, assuming on certain background that I have gathered from all the research. Uh, it will not be in any way uh, record exhaustive or conclusive, you know, if you want to debate about it, uh, we are open actually for discussion. But in the meantime, these two principles that we have learned today, uh, we will apply it okay, into an issue, a relevant issue that I mentioned uh, some earlier on uh, in our latest sermon. So for now, May God help us uh, in understanding his word and more importantly, to apply it in our daily lives. Let us, uh, let us now pray. Father God, we come to you with humility. We come to you with you giving us the wisdom to understand, giving, giving, giving us the strength to apply it uh, in our life, giving us the courage uh, to face the issue of our life, to face our problems, you know. Uh, give us the courage to do that. We ask God that uh, you will come and help us empower us to further understand uh, your word uh, in First Corinthians, particularly in chapter 8 uh, to chapter 11, verse 1, on the issue of food uh, offered to idols and some of the principles that we can apply it uh, to our daily life. We commit all these things to you, Lord, praying all this in Jesus' name. I'll pass the time to uh, Silas to pose us with uh, a song. Thank you, Pastor. And as a response song, I have chosen only a holy God. So if you guys want to stand at home or whatever you're doing now, please um, I encourage you all to sing with me as we sing this final song.
Let us now all stand and receive the benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen. Thank you for coming to our virtual uh, service this morning. Uh, go forth now and serve the Lord. Service is over. Uh, after a moment of silent prayer and meditation, and you may be dismissed.